my pleasure to host Justin today again uh, for another talk on deep learning for quantum chemistry. You're a postdoc at Los Alamos, and you're going to tell us about how to open the black box. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. So um, this is a this is a great. I'm, I'm excited to give a talk at an actual machine learning conference because normally I'm talking to chemists, and so they don't get the actual machine learning aspect of things that we're doing. Um, so our, uh, actually the last talk was, uh, Jennifer's talk was really good because it kind of gives you a, um, idea of what can be done in chemistry. We're coming at things from a little different direction. Actually, it's, uh, it can be, um, a collaborative direction, uh, honestly. Um, so, uh, I work at Los Alamos National Lab right now and I work with, uh, these guys, Tipton Barris and Sergey Tretiak. Uh, I come from the University of Florida, I work with Audrey and Royberg and, uh, collaborated with these fellows at UNC Chapel Hill. So I'm gonna talk about work done with all of these groups. So our application domain is, uh, we're looking at molecular dynamic simulations. So how can we simulate uh, the physics of atoms using machine learning? Uh, your uh, interesting cases here might be protein simulation, simulation of liquids, or the simulation of materials. And the way that we've traditionally done this, we have some energy function, this potential energy, which is a function of the positions of the atoms in the system and uh, your electronic structure as well if you're dealing with a quantum mechanics problem. Uh, we calculate, oh, sorry. Uh, we can get forces from these as the negative gradient of that uh, energy function. And these are guaranteed to be conservative based on the type of function that this energy function is. And we carry out dynamics using Newtonian physics. It's very simple. This just gives you kind of an idea of what one of these simulations looks like. And actually this was fully carried out with machine learning. We're doing these types of simulations right now at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, we're actually scaling these up to millions of atoms at this point where we're doing shock simulations through materials and looking at how the wave front propagates. Uh, so the traditional techniques for doing this would be your, your quantum mechanics methods, which we briefly had mentioned last talk, uh, where you're solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, you have this Hamiltonian that describes different, uh, different physics of your problem. But the real key here is that we're treating the electrons in the system as this probabilistic cloud. And so we have this very expensive um, eigenvalue problem, and it's an iterative eigenvalue problem that we end up having to carry out to, uh, to get an energy out of this problem. There's many techniques for doing this, semi-empirical methods, density functional theory, post hartree fock and the order and the number of electrons in your system grows like this. So this is as the system grows in size, you get up to very expensive, even up to end of the seventh with higher, higher uh, cost couple cluster method. Uh, typically in organic chemistry, they would uh, employ these force fields to simulate something bigger, something that's this size, like a protein in a binding pocket. And the way these work is you have uh, what is effectively a mini body decomposition of your system. So you'd describe torsional uh, four-body interactions, you'd have a bonding term, you'd have angular terms, you'd sum up over all these, put everything else into these non-bonded terms and call that your energy function and you just parameterize everything. So different carbon-carbon bonds, for instance, in different environments would have different parameters that describe how they, how they uh, should interact. And so if you put all this into kind of a big qualitative plot, uh, what you see is that classical methods, which are these force fields, they scale about order n in system size. And as you go down to exact solution, it's completely intractable. And so you get these methods like couple cluster techniques, which are into the seventh scaling. Um, you're not going to run those on anything more than a couple of, uh, of non-hydrogen atoms. And then uh, DFT gets slightly larger, type binding methods slightly larger. So where machine learning is uh, supposed to fit here is we want to predict at some higher level of theory, uh, but using a technique that is closer to the computational scaling of a force field. Um, okay, I'm not gonna spend much time here because I think we've seen this like 20 times now, but the idea is you, we're doing supervised learning. We have inputs. We have some function which is unknown or unknown that you're uh, putting your input inputs into you get a label, and these labels are the things you're trying to fit to. So it's the standard supervised learning process. Deep neural networks, you have an input layer, hidden layers. Um, you have an input vector. You apply your weights, get your pre-activation, apply an activation function, and you get your output. So I won't spend much time unless anyone doesn't know how that works yet. <laughs> um, sorry? 
So we're getting there for our application, but that could be, you know, depends on whatever your problem is, it's your descriptor. Um, so for, for our application, uh, what we end up inputting is effectively coordinates. So this big R here, let that represent a set of coordinates for a given molecule. It could be a benzene, it could be that big material simulation I showed you earlier. Uh, and this, we then compute quantum mechanics uh, data, which is our EIs, and these are our labels. So we know what our function is. The problem is our function is very slow and we don't wanna have to run molecular dynamics on this function because it would, it would, it's intractable. Uh, also, if we take care in the way that we build our data sets and the way that our, our machine learning models built in the end, we can just train to small sets of these things with, with less numbers of atoms and then later test them on things with more atoms. So this is this idea of extensibility, extending up the bigger systems. Uh, so what are these deep learning potentials? Well, uh, there's a couple types uh, that have showed up in literature in the past. So this type here, you'd have some kind of vector, fixed size vector that describes just a molecule. So it could be internal coordinates. What that means is distances between atoms and angles between them. And then you feed this into a deep learning model, you get a property and that's it, very simple. Uh, the, what, what we believe to be the better approach, which has come out probably back in 2005-ish, uh, 2007, people started using this, where you have a fixed size vector describing the chemical environment uh, around a given atom. So for three atoms in this water molecule, you have three vectors, feed this through your deep neural network model, uh, get an atomic property, sum it up, and then your total property represents a sum of, of individual uh, site properties. Uh, for, so I wanna get an idea, give you an idea about what we mean when we talk about something being transferable, or so this would be like general. Uh, a lot of people talking about machine learning needing to generalize. In our case, this means it needs to be transferable and extensible. So transferable just means uh, able to predict on things not in the training set. Extensible is a subset of that, which means able to predict on things larger than what's in your training data set. And this is important because we can't run quantum mechanics to get information to get data about a protein in a box of water. That's 35,000 atoms. It wouldn't finish in my lifetime if I tried to run this. So we wanna be able to train to small things and then eventually have it predict on these bigger systems. So the problem with these fixed size descriptors is that if you were to add, say, another molecule to the system and have a water dimer, uh, that fixed size descriptor is no longer fixed size. You now have more bonds, more distances, more angles between atoms. And so this grows and then your deep neural network needs to be retrained. So it's not, not very useful for that. Um, for these atomic descriptors, since your operation is a sum over properties that you're predicting, it can easily be, uh, you can easily add in another molecule and then get a prediction and your neural networks just need to have been trained to chemical environments that look similar. So this is a, a great place to talk about, again, putting physics back into your model. Um, so why build one of these potentials that's not conservative? We know from physics that these energy functions should be conservative, uh, meaning that the forces should conserve energy if we run time domain simulations on them. Um, so one way you could actually predict forces is you could just directly predict them as a property like this. The problem with this is since machine learning inherently has some kind of error to it, you're never going to conserve forces here because you have some error preventing these things from summing to zero and it actually representing a conservative vector field. The better way to do it is to have your model predict your energy, which is kind of the definition of what, uh, what a conservative vector field is. You predict a scalar a smooth scalar field, and then you take the negative gradient of that to get your forces back to your inputs. And this gives you an idea about, or it gives you the conservative uh, vector field that tells you about where your atom should be moving in space and in time. Uh, so to represent these chemical environments, uh, we have, uh, look at this oxygen here, you have some distance, some atom at a distance, another atom at a distance, and an angle. Uh, if you have another molecule that's outside some cutoff radius distance away, we don't consider it because uh, typically in, in chemistry, when something moves far enough away, the interactions drop off to zero fairly quickly. It's not always the case, so this is a, an approximation. and In some cases, we have to try and fix that. Uh, and then we use some smooth cutoff function to ensure that we don't drop off to zero very quickly or else our forces wouldn't be conservative in the end. Uh, 
we'd have discontinuities in it. Uh, we also choose to make these models uh, invariant with respect to rotation, translation, and permutation of atoms in the system because these are things that you want physically guaranteed in your energy model. You'd have trouble conserving momentum in any simulation if you didn't guarantee this. Um, so there's some common components used uh, to make these descriptors uh, invariant. Uh, back in 2007, Baylor and Perinello introduced uh, these descriptors, which look something like this here. Um, the idea is if you have an atom centered at zero, and then you have some neighbor J at three angstroms away, you're peaking these different functions, and you're reducing overall J atoms into this vector, which is a fixed size uh, vector. So this now is a, once you sum over all the atoms, this describes basically the distribution of atoms in your local chemical environment. There's a similar function that's for angles that describes angles between uh, neighboring atoms with uh, the center atom being the one being the ith atom. And they build functions that look like this and end up summing into a matrix that looks like this. And so with these two types of descriptors, you can get um, not just pairwise, but triple information out of your models. Uh, in 2018 and 2017, we've released uh, modifications of these that just worked better in certain conditions. This one's actually cool because has these mu and sigma are learnable parameters. So we're actually having the machine learning model learn what the descriptors should look like, which makes a little more sense. Uh, we've published so far three uh, models on this topic. So originally in 2017, this one, which was one of the first that showed extensibility uh, and transferability within an entire, um, I would say an entire class of molecules, organic molecules. So if we train this, we train this thing to about 22 million different DFT calculations, so different molecules, and then test it on other organic molecules, and we were getting really good performance out of it. Uh, these models bring back some long-range interactions uh, through an iterative update, and it actually acts more like a graph convolution neural network. Um, so we'll talk more about how that works in a second. And then this uh, third model, which I'll also talk about. So the first one, which I, in my opinion is the simplest, is you have these radial uh, descriptors that build this vector, which I was talking about, if you're summing over your J neighbors, and you're building these uh, angular uh, descriptors, which sum over your JK neighbors, concatenating these, type differentiate them. So if like your neighbor J is a hydrogen, you just put that in a specific place of the array. If your neighbor K is a different type, you put in a different type of the array. Uh, you sum over all your neighbors, feed this into, here it's just a dense, fully connected neural network. It's the most basic thing ever. You get an energy prediction, sum over that, you get your energy. It's a very simple concept. And then for forces, of course, you just take the gradient of this, do a back propagation through the network, through these things, and back to the atomic coordinates. And that's what gives you your forces on atoms. The HIP and N-style neural network, which works more like a graph convolutional model, uh, basically you just take this radial information, you build your uh, radial descriptor vector, and then here you're doing this interaction, which looks like a graph convolution interaction between uh, neighboring sites or between neighboring neural networks. And so um, with this communication, you feed this into a, a dense network. Actually, these are, these are uh, recurrent neural nets. And then uh, you carry out this interaction iteratively over and over again, summing up the predictions along the way until your end result is an energy at site i, summing over those produces your total energy. And so because of these interaction layers being iterative, you're actually able to pull in longer range information than whatever cutoff you put on top of your model. And then the AIMNET style neural network potential is, is the monster of these things, which is uh, recently accepted in uh, science advances. Uh, so you build your radial and angular descriptors, you combine these with these uh, atomic feature vectors, which are now learnable vectors that describe the type of atom that you have. So in the very first iteration, for all hydrogens, they have the exact same vector. For all carbons, they have the exact same vector. Uh, you combine them, sum over all J neighbors, feed it through a neural network, you get an update to your A vectors. So now in the next iteration, 
all hydrogens are not equal, or all carbons are not equal, all oxygens are not equal. So it's like learning what type of atom this should be described as. And then you have this other vector, which is a latent space that you're learning, uh, and you're concatenating that with the new uh, atom type vector. This gets fed through the atomic neural net, another atomic neural network. Uh, so this is on each site. And then you can predict different quantities from here, such as the energy at that site, sum up with your total energy. It can actually predict charges as well. We show that it predicts other quantities that are very useful to chemists. And the neat thing here is that you, through this process, you get this T, these iterative updates of your uh, atomic, of these uh, atomic feature vectors. And so what you can see in this plot up here is that uh, here we have the DFT charge. So this is our reference level of theory charge. This is our model's predicted charge. On iteration one, what we're looking at is the charge on this sulfur with respect to changing this functional group R with these different groups shown on the plot. And the key here is that these are all outside of the cutoff radius of the model. The model can't see further than 4.6 angstroms explicitly. But through this iterative update, um, at t equals two, you actually, so at t equals one, you see that it's flat. It's not learning anything about that changing that R group at a further cutoff radius. And then at later iterations, it starts matching the DFT better because it's actually able to pull in longer range information uh, from the chemical environment. And so to give you an idea of how accurate these things are, um, we actually did a big active learning work where we, where we let the model drive itself through chemical space to figure out what new data should be included on the next iteration. And uh, our model is shown here on this correlation plot. So we have, uh, this is our model, and this is the reference level of theory. It's density functional theory. And this is a log plot. So actually, the vast majority of the data is pretty spot on our prediction. These two, DFTB and PM6, are semi-empirical methods. We're just showing as a baseline to show you that even comparing quantum mechanics methods to themselves, we fit very accurate, accurately to our level of theory. These are faster quantum mechanics methods, which are considered less accurate, but they're what people typically would use to go to simulating something that's a couple hundred atoms. Um, and, uh, sorry? Oh, this is a test set. Yeah, these molecules, every one of them is bigger than anything in the training data set. Yeah, so this is a this is a protein that's got about th uh, 150 atoms. This one's a protein with 312 atoms. And these are force predictions, by the way, not direct energy predictions. Um, and so we wanted to look at how well this could actually be used in a, in a, in a bulk phase simulation. So we took this uh, protein uh, with a drug lig ligand in the binding pocket. The reason this is interesting is because drug companies would be interested in running these simulations and actually obtaining the free energy of this thing binding inside of this, this pocket, and then they can get an idea of whether or not it's, say, uh, relatively uh, more stable than another molecule that they're looking at. Uh, and this system had about 35,000 atoms. This is something you could never run with quantum mechanics, ever. It just wouldn't happen. You're, you'd run out of memory, probably. <laughs> uh, and this contains seven different elements inside of this drug ligand. Um, so the big, the big thing here is just the time is amazing. Like we're able to get about a time step. So a single force calculation for all 35,000 atoms done in about 300 milliseconds or so. And the simulation actually converged to about a one angstrom RMSD, which means that the structure is not falling apart. So it's kind of showing you that it's actually retaining the crystal structure that we originally uh, got off of the protein data bank. Now, the really cool thing about this is, imagine you've only trained a model to organic chemistry. What would you expect it would do if you then showed it something that's more of a materials problem, like a whole bunch of carbon in a box at a high temperature? Most people would say it wouldn't work, you'd get garbage out or something. But actually, so we run this simulation, it's uh, uh, 4,000 atoms, 2,500 Kelvin, and we start, this model, is, keep in mind, it's only ever seen organic chemistry. And the machine learning is actually able to figure out that uh, you should be forming these fullerenes when you run a high temperature simulation of carbon. So I think this is just like a great example of the power of machine learning to pick out uh, physics that you wouldn't expect it to. And uh, that's, that's it. I think I went a little short, but <laughs> we're over.